Good evening. It is Tuesday night. It's cheese night, and we have Stephen and George Fletcher of the famous Berkswell. The famous Berkswell. Good afternoon, guys. Right. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? How is your year going so far? Oh, <laughs> better, better than last one. <laughs> yeah. Um, been, I mean, you can use any metaphor you want, roller coaster or whatever. You know, it's just been been crazy, really. You know, emotions from one extreme to the other. Um, income from one extreme to the other. Uh, yeah, it's just been crazy. Mm, you a know. lot of learning curves. Huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, we've well, learned, we have we've learned massive. I think we've learned more about our business in the last twelve months than we had in the last thirty years, almost mm. really. Okay, okay, that wasn't the answer I was expecting. All right, let's 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 go down to to before. Let's go before COVID. Before you you had the Magimix got hold of your business. Um, and, uh, and 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 date back. So you've been making cheese since, if I've got this right, 1989. Is that right? Yeah, we started milking sheep in the January of 1989. And we started making cheese in the autumn of 1989. I mean, that puts you right at the top of the sheep's milk um, experience inside the UK. There is very little precedent for sheep's milk cheeses in this in this country. Yeah, but. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've worked down hard. At I mean, the Burksville now isn't like, isn't the same cheese we started out with. It's evolved, most definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, it's taken a long time. Uh, and if I look, think back now, that you know, the Burksville that we were making, say, even in the early 90s, is not the same cheese as it is now. We've, 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 we've worked at it, and we've, we've had some ups and downs. We've had some problems with it. You know, it went off the rails for a bit, and we've got it back again. Um, so uh yeah and you never stop learning do you you know it's as they say with, with cheese it's, it's a new vintage every day and, and that's i think puts in a nutshell really yeah it is a new vintage every day and it's uh frustrating I mean, ewes milk uh, or sheep's milk is 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 almost the most difficult in the sense that um it's got some unusual solid ratios and mm. you've got you, it's, a, it's, a, it's an animal you cannot pull out a season it needs to you know the herd lambs when it lambs it's not it's not you can't spread it through the year well, we, well, we we do try to do that. To be fair, um, for the last well, quite a long time, twenty years, we've been lambing in the we had an autumn lambing flock, so we have actually produced milk all year round. But it's they're very challenging to manage. Um, we're swimming against the tide, really, because sheep being short day breeders, you know, we're lambing them as the days are getting shorter, um, mm -hmm. and we try to milk them as the days are getting shorter. But um, but it's, it's challenging, but also interesting. Although we do milk all year round, most of the sheep are in the spring, and the milk can change day to day um, when they're turned out and what the grass is doing throughout the summer. So mm -hmm. it, it's a good challenge to, to have to manage that, but a really, really interesting challenge because the cheese is never the same each day. It's, mm -hmm. It varies through the seasons mm -hmm. as well. I mean, um, you know, we make some of our best cheese in the autumn. Um, generally speaking, if we want to enter a competition, we'll try and pick a an autumn cheese. Yeah. Um, and, All right. Uh, yeah. Well, let's 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 um uh, let's start with you. So you you started making cheese with thirty five ewes back in nineteen eighty nine. Why yeah. did you do that? Why did we start making cheese? Yeah. Um, well, it was never our intention to make cheese. I mean, when we started in, as you say, in eighty nine, uh, the health food. Thing was really getting going there wasn't really a food culture existing then like there is now no, i mean no, you know, there, were, well. there weren't the tv chefs that there are now there certainly weren't the cookie programs on the tv etc cetera, etc cetera. um and we were tapping in we thought we'd tap into the, the rapid rise in in health food interest in health food and sheep's milk was, was part of that but the, the demand was nowhere near um uh, big enough and then one of the local farm shops that we were supplying milk to um the lady came to us one day and said look my goat's milk cheese maker is um is packing up she's retiring would you consider making some cheese for us and we thought well yeah we'll give it a go um we hadn't made any cheese but cheese had been made at the farm uh, in the old warwickshire style many generations ago my grandfather was alive then and he couldn't remember his mother making cheese so it goes back quite a way but we well, that is that's um, quite a lot backwards yeah but there was a there's an upstairs southwesterly facing bedroom which we know was used as a cheese maturation room um the, the, the original elm floorboards are very badly eroded 
uh, which from the contact of, of the way coming from the cheese. And then we uncovered one of the doorways into that room. Uh, and lo and behold, we didn't know this, but until we uncovered it, um, we just thought it was a boarded up doorway. But the door was still in that doorway. And it got the word, word cheese room painted across it. So um, that was, that was that. an amazing, amazing discovery. Um, sadly, we've never been able to find any recipes tucked away under the floorboards. I mean, the floor's been replaced now. But um, <laughs> it was, and then also, and then the, the farm kitchen that we use now was originally the farm dairy. Um, uh -huh. it, had, it had stone thralls around the outside, uh, out, around the inside of the walls, I should say. And then uh, apparently, and there's also a bacon smoker. The, the, the chimney anybody who's seen a picture around all is, is one big chimney stack in the middle but inside that there are six flues and one of those is a bacon smoker well a meat smoker oh, um, right. so uh, you know they may have smoked cheese in there we don't we don't know and, and there is no um to anybody's knowledge there's no, about, there's no written history to the farm sorry but you're talking about a farm that would have done a little bit of everything aren't you i mean yeah, it would well, have made cheese yeah, made well, butter must smoke yeah. hams the whole thing yeah yeah, I mean, one of the rooms, the rooms that we use as like a daily sit, sitting room and a telly and whatnot is, that was the butchery. Um, and there's a big Inglenook fireplace there. And yeah. on the one side, it's badly worn away where they used to sharpen the knives on the on the sandstone okay. um, fireplace. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's also a quarry tile floor, which slopes to the corner. And there used to be a hole in the corner where they'd wash the blood out at the, the end of the day's work. Um, and then, yeah, there's a dairy, there's a brewery. Uh, there's a little extension on the end of the house built not long wow. after the house was completed they think that was a brewery uh that's also got a bread oven in it <laughs> so, yeah. mm. um and uh and then there's a malt drying pit down the side of the chimney as well a what a malt drying pit what what's a malt drying pit a pit where you dry malt well malt and hops possibly for drying both of them but for beer making okay for, for the brewery. Um, I'm just reading a picture of Ram Hall. It's a beautiful building, isn't it? Yeah, it's um and as you say, it's got this huge stack in the um uh yeah. of, of chimneys in the middle. It's it's yeah. almost like an industrial stack, except in a very that, beautiful they draw there's say so there's six flues within that stack, and the fireplaces downstairs are all spread out. If, if you took away the house away from the chimney, yeah, it's quite a, quite a structure, I think. You know, it's it's massive wow. at, at the ground level. And then it's so, the, the, sorry, go on. So, so I mean, what you're describing is is not a house, but a factory. You no, know, I think it, it would have been an absolute hive of activity when it was really buzzing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it would have been the cheese making, the beer making, the the butchery. Everything was going on in that in that um in that house. And and yeah. and but you were you were at that time were you were simply you were simply farming. Not not farming is simple or anything, but you weren't in production of beer of butchery of um of cheese at that time you were you were no, no, no. the no, traditional no. method of the of the 20th century which was grow animals sell animals yes yeah we, we were milking cows that was mm. the primary uh, enterprise on the farm and i when i came home from college for example we were milking dairy cows um and then the milk quota situation wasn't particularly good for us and um, we looked around at something different to an alternative Source of income. But it's quite interesting in recent, especially the last couple of years, we, we're sort of starting to go back to not to the same extent. We're not going to have a brewery and, and things, but it's going oh, back. Don't to, never say never. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, uh, but we're going back to that sort of s lots of small enterprises. Like we've, we, we've got pigs on the farm now um, for, for, to feed the way to. Uh, oh. And we're sort of growing more sort of traditional. Um, well, we should go into hopefully uh, heritage grains um, and it's yeah just sort of getting out of the sort of commodity um, agriculture and putting it all together really. Yeah, it's, it's not a particularly big farm mm. um, and so we're able to you know um, dovetail these alternative enterprises in without too much um, difficulty. How, how many acres do you, do you farm? It's about 360 there or thereabouts. Yeah, We've just lost some to HS2 actually so it's a bit less than that now. Oh, someone's driven a train through the middle of your plans then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We could have done without it, but there you go. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> was that was bollocks at that point, or is that rude on TV? Bollocks again, sorry? Are you allowed to say bollocks at that point? I mean, I'm it assuming might, Yeah, whatever you like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's, let's not go there. Let's, yeah. let's, let's enjoy ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, subject up. 
Okay, so we're back to our 35 sheep, um, which you are now milking because um, somebody wants you to give it a go. And you, partly because obviously your house and your family have got a history of, you know, turning your hand to it, turn your hand to milking sheep um, and try to ride into this, this demand on the health side, not realizing you are one of the very early adopters of the British cheese renaissance. Um, and and people are going to be turning your way pretty soon. I mean, the 90s was a time when the cheesemakers really began to re-emerge in the country. Yeah, I, I think the biggest um, leg up we had really was um, we were getting going at the same time as the British Cheese Awards were formed, and um, Juliet Harbert was the driving force behind that, and we were lucky enough to... To win some awards there and i think the the publicity side of, of that the whole british cheese awards was fantastic because it, juliet was was um promoting it and she was putting the the award winners into in in front of the press we were appearing in um sunday supplement you know, um the broadsheet sunday supplements we were in, appearing in bbc good food magazine country life uh, and all you know um at, at, on pure on the on the back of the British Cheese Awards, we we would never have had gained access to that sort of publicity without that. Uh -huh. uh, and also, I think at the same time, being members of the, of the Special Cheese Makers Association, because they were also getting going. Um, and it was all about meeting. It was giving the the maker the opportunity to meet the meet the, the trade. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, that that the, the British Cheese Awards at that time were a, were a massive help to us. Yeah. Most definitely. I mean, I've, I've got in my notes here that you've won 11 gold medals at the British Cheese Awards. I mean, that's yeah, a I monstrous think, result. Yeah, I think it's something like that, 11 or 12. Yeah, I know we were. Yeah, we've been lucky. I mean, we, you know, we've. Uh, I've got it. Excuse me, I'm not swearing at you. Never put down to luck what you can claim for yourself. I found that being honest well, is not a good plan. Okay, well, the doors are quite small in this house, so I have to get made through them as it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think. Yeah, it, it, I think also we were in the right place at the right time. I mean, you know, we, we were at the when specialist cheese making really was, you know, the, the, the ball started to roll and we were there at the beginning. I think we were very lucky to, for that. Um, and I have to give also, you know, a, a lot of credit to the guys at Neil's Yard Dairy, Fine Cheese Company, Paxton and Whitfield and whatnot. Um, they've been tremendously supportive over the years. And, uh, you know, to be able to supply them is a, is a real privilege. And um, uh, you know, it's it's a very it's a, a real relationship we have with, with some of our customers, you know, and it, it brings a lot of pleasure as well. I've I've often said that uh, you go to a gathering of um, small scale artisan cheese makers, everybody's so nice. Yeah, you know, everybody's so nice, it, it, and it's a real sharing of ideas. You have a chat, you can unload off onto people, and they'll unload onto you. You know, and um, it really is. It's a it's a it's a fantastic um, little industry, and I, you know, we really, really are privileged to be part of it. I would totally agree. Um, you get all these burly farmers like yourselves knocking around, starting getting really nerdish about bacterial counts and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, we we were saying not so long ago that um, we've we've almost moved now from farmers who make cheese. We're it's a subtle difference. We're, I think now we feel we're cheesemakers who produce their own milk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what our, that's our focus is, is that because we only use our own milk for Berkswell and it all goes into Berkswell. And so, I mean, George is, is, is really taking initiative on this and we're really analysing quite closely how we make our milk and what we use to make that milk in terms of what we feed the sheep, how we manage the sheep. And our focus now is entirely i mean things like yields and whatnot are secondary it, it's it's the it's the medium that we are producing with which we make the cheese that, that's the most important our focus is on the farm is the quality of the milk the quality, is quality. Is unique, unique, unique to us as well there's we, we do all the hard work of producing the milk if we can have produce that from forage that was produced on the farm rather than sort of bought in feed mm -hmm. then it's to be unique and the taste is going to be unique to this farm and um that's what we're aiming for really that's 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 so true it's it's as soon as you start mixing up farms milk the character disappears it goes it evaporates yeah right well, i mean the, the, you know the, the french have a word we've done there and I, I can't always say it. it's terroir isn't it terroir whatever you call it <laughs> yes you know yeah i can't oh, say it very well. sorry that's the word 
It is, it is, but I, I get frustrated with the French because they lean quickly into the ground and the weather and the minerals, and they don't put a lot of emphasis on the skill and the history and the the what's gone into making the right recipe to make the most of that terroir. You know, not you know, it working, learning. There's a sort of social side of learning to work with your land and make the most of what it offers. It's so important, and that's what you've done for thirty two years. Mm. Yeah. You, yeah, I think they're, they're right. It's it's not. It's more. It's more of a guided approach. You um, you sort of guide it from like the like they say the, the soil and, and things. But it's 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 a lot of skill in it. But there's there's things like keeping the it's like the microbial uh, life in the milk alive and not pasteurizing and making sure everything's right at every step of the way. But you're 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 guiding it. If you, yeah. if, you, if you understand, yeah. not, for, not forcing anything. Yeah. No, I mean, I've heard other cheesemakers talk about the fact that you are not just shepherds of sheep, but you're shepherds of bacteria. It's about mm -hmm. making them, uh, you, you can't control them. You, the best you can do is herd them in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you, you don't want to, with sort of antibacterial wipes and things, it, it, it kills off the good bacteria as well as the bad. It's not all about being yeah. as clean as possible. But, um, no, it's very much not. Clean, clean but not sterile. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, well, I know what you mean. So you you went from 35, and I'm right in saying you've now got 350 sheep you're milking. Um, no, we milked about um, 650. Yeah, 12 months, 650, yeah. 700. We actually cut back wow. a little bit. We were sort of 950. And we found that was too many. Um, and we've changed our breeding a bit. We're introducing the Lacoon breed into our Friesens, which is the French uh, dairy sheep that they used mm. to produce the milk for off for. Um, mm. And that's giving us a different dimension. Yeah. That, that's that's going back to uh, producing the milk more off, off forage, really. If we can, uh, they're still a very much dairy breed, but they'll they've got a bit more sort of uh, meat on them, and they'll they don't need quite as much sort of concentrates and and. And, and bought in feed and they hopefully will thrive off the pastures that we've got here yeah, the, the freezing is the traditional dairy sheep but they are incredibly high maintenance um in all sorts of ways you uh, let's be honest sheep are stupid okay well, <laughs> they're, well, they're, they're deaf but they're not stupid Charlie. <laughs> you know um I've, I've come to that i have spent the best years of my life milking sheep and i've come i've come to the they, they're deaf but they're not they know which side their bread's butted on that i can assure you <laughs> that. When I was a kid, we we farmed uh, we had farmed sheep for me, and um, and the only inventive thing about a sheep, as far as I was concerned, is it found new ways to die. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's a given. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it is it is amazing. So we've got Claire has asking what kind of breed of sheep you have. So you introduced the Lacoon, um, and then you're saying from a sort of a Frisian base. Is that um, we started with Friesland, and we've also over the years introduced a little bit of Pole Dorset, um, which is now fading out again. But yeah, our current thinking is we, we, we're introducing some of the lacoon genetics which are french dairy breed um just to make reason a little bit more physically robust and just a little bit more versatile and alison's asking um uh, are the sheep hand milked so i'm assuming no no, <laughs> no. 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 We, we use a modern milking parlor uh, we can milk 40 at once you know, it's it's, um, it's a scale. It works on exactly the same principle as a dairy cow parlour, but the um, things like the vacuum level and whatnot are different. It's slightly, you know, it is, it is specifically designed for sheep, but it works on exactly the same principle as a cow parlour. So, uh, in, in average Holston Friesian cow is going to produce, up, you know, a, a high performer would be thirty-five liters a day. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. But so, what are you getting from your sheep? Um, average probably about two. Uh, it, it can vary quite a lot. Some of them, sort of higher yielders, can be giving four liters a day, and then mm -hmm. some will just be prodding on sort of one, one and a half. But yeah, like it, 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 it like after, straight after, well, a few weeks after lambing, uh, a lot of them will sort of be up to three, three and a half, four, uh, and then it, it just just t sort of slowly tails off um, through the so because of naturally the lactation getting longer and drying up, but also the, the quality of grass dropping throughout yeah, through yeah. Late, late summer, mm. and also the daylight lengths as well. As the daylight lengths shorten, then the sheep naturally wants to wants to dry off. Um, uh, and so, I mean, I'm, I, I always work on the basis that your, your, your litre of milk from a cow is 
28 to 30p or something of that order but it's about a pound for sheep is that the sort of wholesale price what do you yeah that's a roughly the whole i think varies depending on who's buying it anywhere between 90p of one pound 20 one pound 30 um and we we won't give our stuff away too lot. we do sell a bit and they have to pay for it because it, it is cheese making milk it's not yeah. it's not commodity you know it's not, it's not we don't concentrate on, i said earlier we don't really concentrate on, on yields um you know it's solids that we're after so the the yield right. is, is some secondary really well talking of solids we've gone 20 minutes and we've not really talked about your cheese so let's yeah, get <laughs> um, your cheese is very very famous for its shape it is the original flying saucer the story goes that you didn't have enough um uh molds so you went down the local market and bought a bunch of calendars is that true um, there's, some, there's some of that yeah the, if you want to know what the, the the true story is my um my mother went on a cheese making course the, the, the first cheese we were made from sheep's milk was made by um a, a neighboring farmer um sally who came and helped us get cheese making going um and then my mother decided she ought to go on a cheese course to support us so she went to otley college and she learned the technique of hand filling colanders uh and brought that back and then the two of them sort of put their heads together and so and that's how the works have evolved but um yeah we we've stuck with the colanders because they were at the time they were quite easy to to find and um as we made more cheese you just went down the, the local hardware shop and bought more colanders but then when we, when we needed to replace them um some years afterwards colanders were becoming a kitchen ornament and you could get very fancy enameled metal ones but you couldn't get a bog standard white plastic colander for love and the money so, I, I, um, I, I, got, yeah. I got on the internet and i ended up on the dollar shop online and, and i thought yep that's just what we want <laughs> so I mean, this is amazing. We contacted the dollar shop online and we said, who makes these colanders for you? They said, oh, it's a, it's a firm in Illinois um, called Arrow, Arrow Mouldings, I think. So I contacted them and we imported a couple of thousand of them. And uh, yeah, it was quite, a, quite an experience, really. You know, we never, you know, we, we were the sole, we went through the whole process of organising the courier and, you know, transport and shipping and everything. Right. And uh, yeah, so if you if, we've got a few, if you ever if you want a spare calendar, you can give us a shout. Yeah. Out. How how far through your thousand calendars are? are, are oh, you? we've actually we've got quite a long way through them because they don't you know, they they have a limited life. Mm. They, they 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 get quite a lot of stick and um, they they split or they you know, crack or whatever, and uh -huh. so we chuck them out and get another one. But they clean well, and um, yeah, they and, do. Yeah, yeah, they clean. So run through how you make it. So how you know. It's a rennet set, obviously. How long are you? Um, is it a high schooled, low schooled? What's the what? What is your technique? Oh, dear, George. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> George has been spending some time with dairy recently, so I thought he might know. Um, well, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, you know, right, certain but things are sacred, but uh, yeah, it's what I say to people. It's a pretty basic, a routine make, mm -hmm. in the sense of our. Our temperatures are nothing um, that different. Um, our time, so we, we, we use a combination of of um, titratable acidity and, and time lapse and touchy feely as well. You know, it is 100% 100 handmade. There is not one piece of machinery involved. Not one button is pressed to activate anything and any of the yeah. bats. It's all totally handmade. Um, it's hand cut with, with heart. Do, do you use um, a style recipe where you get the curd out on the table and and, and nope. mill it or anything like that so or do you leave it under the way and uh yeah. let you do so it's yeah. a european it's, it's, it's yeah. what we at the academy, yeah. academy call it acidify in mold not acidify in bat it's, yeah yeah when, when we're ready to mold just just um, open the tap let the weight uh, start to drain out and then we're molding as it's draining out and by the end it, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, the way is gone. Yeah, the, the curd is left in the way. The, yeah. the, the curd is at moulding. The curd is taken from the vat into yeah. into the mould. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, it, it's just a very basic. There's nothing. And you're salting it through, through wash. Pardon? How are you salting it? Dry salt. Dry salt on the outside. Yeah. 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 So mean, that is, um, that is kind of an interesting sort of anglicization of a French recipe, really, isn't it? 
Yeah, it, it is, I suppose. It, it's like, also... not, not inspired. It's very much trial, trial and error yeah. when, when you started. It's not like they didn't take a recipe from France uh, and sort of based it on that, really. No. It was really sort of, um, we've got this milk. <laughs> yeah, I remember when Sally made her the very first cheese, she got some college notes out, and, one, and the first recipe she actually read to was a Carefilly recipe. <laughs> There's a bad resemblance to a care filly, but that was the spark that you know, that's how she got going. But yeah, I, I, as George said, we, as I said earlier in the conversation, and I think back to the, the birch in the early 90s, it doesn't really resemble the birch we make now. It, it, it has evolved. We've tried brining, we've tried this, we've tried that, we've tried double dipping back into the way. Um, and we just stay with what we, we're doing, you know? And I think it's it's more more focusing on the attention to detail it, it, it is so easy to um get it wrong mm -hmm. if you're not on the ball constantly all the time you know it's quite unforgiving in that sense um there's like we, very little room for maneuver we were saying earlier you can you, when we're tasting the cheeses even a couple of months down the line but if there's a, a batch we're not quite happy with we'll still look for the notes and Julie, our chief, like, oh yeah, we were, we were really stressed that day, or or we were a bit short. And um, it's yeah. it's um, it's like it's a one hundred percent reflection of that day. Yeah, yeah. In all exactly. its different variations, you know, um, because again, and it is, I keep banging on about it, and it, it sounds, bit, but it is because it is literally hand made. Mm -hmm. You know, from everything, from the timing of of when the when the starters added, when the rennets added, everything added is. Nothing's automated. It's all mm -hmm. on the decision of, of the day. I mean, we've got three ladies in the cheese room. They can all make. And so, you know, they they, they share the making around. Um, Julie's in, in charge, very much so. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it is attention to detail. And I think it's, it's also having green fingers. You know, I don't think I don't think anybody can be a cheese maker. I think it's a, it's a real skill that um, you can either develop that skill you can yeah. we, we, we are hugely lucky we've got three people in the dairy and they're fantastic they're just yeah they're absolutely legends they really yeah, are yeah, yeah. and, and that, you, you need people like that if it's, when it's so handmade it, you mm. need that bit of the detail that and, continuity that love that kind of care yeah, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah it is yeah and what about the next step because one of the you know if you look at sheep's milk cheeses across europe and all that kind of thing um it, it is a, is a cheese that changes radically from the moment you've made it to what if you keep it for a year or, or however long you keep it you know it's a cheese milk starts off relatively white relatively soft and it and it develops little holes it gets older the color changes the profile the flavor profiles what what's your favorite age for your cheese i would say that the age and also the time of year. My my favourite cheeses, I would say, probably are made around the end of the mid midwinter. Um, I think some of that is because the milk is a very consistent product. Then the, the sheep are indoors. Um, their environment is the same every day. Their ration, their diet's the same every day. Um, and I think we get a much more consistent period in our in our production. Um, and five to six months. I would say. I mean, we we taste. Um, we do a taste. We do a. Well, Julie does a four week tasting, um, and that is really just to try and determine texture. Uh, four weeks is very little flavor. If there is flavor development at four weeks, then you know it's going to blow your socks off at six months old. Um, okay. But we're looking for texture really because we do. If we have a problem, it's generally with the texture becoming a little bit dry, so we can identify at quite an early stage um, anything we think might just start to dry a bit sooner and we can manage that accordingly but um yeah once it goes above six probably eight months it, it starts to change and it becomes very much like a parmesan and we've got a lot of customers who really enjoy it at that age and um great and shave with it you know use it in cooking rather than a uh, a cheese board cheese oh. and then we had some um we took to over a year old um we gave it a different name and um that was a that was a really nice cheese, um, quite dry, but uh, and different to Berksfell, but still a very clean, um, yeah, very, very clean really cheese. Nice. Grated, yeah, uh, grated. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. that's a sort of um, 
in, in the Manchego style, that Viejo, as they say, um, it becomes almost too dense a flavor to eat in a cheese board style. Yeah. It, it becomes, yeah. a, it becomes a, 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 um, almost like a garnish for tapas and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's too dry. It, it doesn't lend itself to, yeah, it's a bit, and it's a bit chewy as well. You know, it, it doesn't lend itself to cheese board cheese once it gets very old. Okay, we've got a tacky question coming from Jonathan Tash. Why do you choose to coat the cheese rather than cloth wrap or allow a natural rind? Right. Okay. Um, we started using uh, what's generally known as plastic coat quite early on when we were having trouble with the cheeses cracking when they were um, very young. They they spend about five days in the make room mm -hmm. and then they come out of the make room and we were finding, I guess it was lack of experience or whatever, we were finding they were cracking quite, quite seriously and um, we didn't quite know what to do. And um, we have, we're quite close to um, Fowlers of Earlswood, the fact that Fowlers Cheese Makers. David was incredibly helpful to us in our early days. He was literally a walking encyclopedia of cheese making. And he suggested that we use a product called um, Plastic Coat, which just put a very thin film over it and it just helps the cheese. Um, it slows the drying process of, of the rind net quite a lot. Um, it's relatively easy to to apply. Uh, it, it's very. Th it doesn't prevent the rind forming. Um, we have then tried um, uh, not doing it with mixed with mixed success. Um, but quite a few cheeses do use it. Well, we were um, talking to Jeff Jones a couple of weeks ago. I was going to mention that the previous gentleman um, uses it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> I've not really got an opinion on it one way or another. We we it's a good insurance for us. Um, our EHO quite likes it because it it's you know it's protecting the the product. You know the purists will say, oh, it's you know it's awful stuff. You shouldn't. I, I, you, there are no purists on on this channel. Um, there is only good cheese. Um, yeah. I I really I I think it's the cheese makers' license to do what the hell they like. Frankly, well, yeah, it, it works for us, uh, mm. uh, and you know and. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as far as I can yeah. see. Yeah. You still get yeah, an amazing um, sort of diverse rot rinds on, yeah. on the cheese as it matures after it's been painted. Yeah, we do get some great molds yeah. forming on it. Yeah. yeah, you do. And it's got some of those nice, distinctive, rusty colours as well, yeah. Um, yeah. Which, yeah. which I always rather like. Um, uh, I, I do I do agree with you, and I'm sure Jonathan's the same. Um, uh, it's, it's You have so many challenges as a cheesemaker. Um, you've got to pick your battles in in some respects, um, and uh, and and you've got to be able to do it in a way that's economically competitive and delivers the flavour profile you want. And you know, for some people that means pasteurisation. For other people, that means um, uh, you know uh, using different milks. For, 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 so I, I strongly think that the cheesemaker finds their way, and you clearly have. I mean, you've got you've got trophies like very few others. Yeah, they are. Which way? That way. There are. Yeah, yeah. You hit the nail on the head. It is very. It, cheese makers and and farmers that are making cheese. It's very unique to where they are, mm. um, what milk they that they can get, and it. Yeah, it's never really look at someone's all. What? Why are you doing that? But if, if if that's what they need to do to provide mm. to produce the best best cheese they can, that's mm. that's what they do. Mm. Um, and one of the questions being asked is, um, would you would you make a blue cheese? We did touch on this before we before we we started talking um, on the show. You just make the one cheese. You've considered other things, but at the end of the day, you come back to um, to to this one. It works well every single time. Yeah. It's, a, it's a credit to like my dad and the cheese makers look, when they started um, to not need to uh, tr try different cheese. All, all the milk was going into Berkswell because it was popular and people liked it and. And we were, they were sort of perfecting the, the Burke's well. And you sort of think, if, if we can perfect Burke's well, what, what, why try other, other cheeses? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, did, we did dabble with a few soft cheeses, but we found we were taking our eye off the ball a little bit. Um, you mentioned blue. Um, Burke's well does get some blue in it now and again. Um, some people don't mind it. I mean, we get, uh, some people call it lightning strikes, which I quite like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, a nice phrase. We do get complaints from wholesalers, which sometimes it's a bit um, 
frustrating when it's just a little speck of blue in the corner. Um, but it, it happens, you know, and sometimes you'll get a bit of a run of it. And um, we pretty, over the years, we've, every time it happens, we analyse why we think it's happened and we can probably work out what has gone wrong. I mean, going right back many years ago, I don't even remember call when blue tongue virus was um, around. We vaccinated all our ewes against blue tongue because that was the, we were almost being ordered to by DEFA really. Uh, and the cheese was rubbish for the last two weeks after the vaccination for blue tongue. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, 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 all sorts of things can affect yeah. it. You know, the, yeah. you have to be very careful, very, very careful in the winter with, with the silage we feed. It's good quality, um, very good, it has to be very good quality. I mean, the sheep, not because of the sheep eating as much of them, and they all pick through, but um, you just don't want any, um, uh, you don't want any butyric, um, no, at all, you know, no, uh, otherwise you're going to get blowing yeah. and all sorts of weird stuff, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, we have actually been talking for 35 minutes now, which is well, six minutes, which is which is six minutes over my rules. So, obviously, this conversation has value. Um, I hope people have very much enjoyed hearing what you're talking about. You're, you, you've, you've told the story of 32 years of a lot of hard work, a lot of improvements, um, a lot of focus, um, and that's made um, Berks World what it is today. I mean, you guys have done a great job and deserve a lot of credit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we will continue. Yeah, next yeah. Five years. We, have a, we have a healthy overdraft, so we've got to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer's curse. He can never give up. He can never give up. Yeah. Okay, Charlie, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you all the people who've been watching. Um, and uh, if there's one takeaway here is buy more Berkswell. Is that the fair Absolutely. comment? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes as a given. Thank yeah. you very much, Stephen and George. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Thank you.